Uh, our next speaker is Kenis Forte, who is uh, working on her doctorate at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She is working on the many, many multivalent aspects of the Sacri Monti, uh, the relation between the art of these sites and the geographies, political systems, cultural identities, and devotional practices. And uh, the, tape, the paper she's going to give us now uh, exemplifies what she is doing. It is about uh, the figures with goiters, and her, t her title is Symptom and Symbol, Goiters as a Link Between Art, Landscape, and Local Devotion in the Italian Sacri Monti. So, um, please, uh, Kenneth, it's, your, uh, it's up your turn. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here and for, for having me. I'll share my screen now. A bit louder, please. Uh, is that better? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, goiters have been an integral part of the sculptural decoration at the Italian Sacri Monti since Gaudenzio Ferrari's early work in the Crucifixion Chapel of Verallo. Six of the nine Sacri Monti recognized by UNESCO include at least one sculpture of a man with a goiter and have, sorry, I lost my place. Um, some of the mountains have as many as four or five such figures scattered throughout multiple chapels and at least four related sites, which might be described as unofficial or pseudo sacri monti, also feature Gozzuti within the spiritual narratives they depict. The sacri monti are very localized phenomenon, and so are goiters, which were particularly common in this mountainous region of northern Italy throughout the early modern period. I argue that recurring images of the men with goiters demonstrate the unity of the Sacri Monti as a group and underscore their function as a system of pilgrimage sites that rely on art to encourage spiritual devotion and reinfor reinforced church approved doctrine. The inclusion of Gozzuti in multiple chapels and at multiple Sacri Monti highlights the mountains connections to each other, to the local population and to the physical landscapes in which they were built. In the early modern period, goiters were nearly synonymous with the alpine communities of Switzerland and Lombardy. Most goiters are caused by iodine deficiency, which serves to regulate the production of hormones in the thyroid gland. Significant lack of this material, therefore, allows hormone, hormone secretion to continue unchecked and causes the thyroid gland to swell as a result. Until the mid 20th century, medical experts pointed to local water sources as the cause of this problem. Oh, not yet, sorry. But modern studies have shown that water was only part of the problem. As, earlier, as early as the first century BCE, Vitruvius wrote in De Architectura that goiters originated in the springs of the Alps. Pliny also suggested that polluted drinking water was to blame for the various types of swellings that occurred in men's throats. In the 12th and 13th centuries, Physicians from the famous medical schools at Bologna, Pavia, and Salerno suggested a number of water-based cures for goiters, such as changing one's water and location, drinking seawater, ingesting powdered seaweed, and applying a poultice made with sea sponges. Salt water's high iodine content made these treatments fairly effective for the newer and smaller goiters that travelers passing through the Alps often developed, but they could not cure the most extreme cases in the region's permanent residence. Medical studies, census data, and conscription records from 19th and early 20th centuries reveal just how many people in the Alps were affected by goiters before this condition was fully understood. In the town of Grocken in Visp, um, for example, at least 75% of the local school-aged children had a palpable or visible goiter. This map produced by Otto Steiner shows the percentage of military recruits with visible goiters the year before the Swiss government began introducing state-sponsored programs to distribute iodized salt in 1922. Young men were often excused from mandatory military service if they had a goiter that caused breathing problems or was deemed to be strongly disfiguring. Far fewer studies on goiters have been conducted in Italy than in Switzerland over the course of the last century. 
but in his seminal text, History and Iconography of Endemic Goiter and Cretinism, Franz Merke suggests that whatever holds true north, of, whatever holds true of the north side of the Alps must also apply to the south side. A report issued by Dr. Muja at the International Conference on Goiter, however, suggests that this may not have been the case. Historically, goiters may have been even more prevalent in Italy than in the Swiss cantons because of the almost exclusive reliance on marine salt throughout the Italian peninsula, which is leached of iodine during the refining process. Eastern Switzerland, on the other hand, consumed mostly rock salt imported from Franche-Comte, which tends to retain higher levels of iodine because it is less processed. In the early 1960s, Merca determined that the regional prevalence of goiters in the Alps was caused by the movement of glaciers during the last ice age. As they flowed downhill over a period of millennia, the weight of the glaciers eroded layers of topsoil and the meltwater that followed during cycles of warmer weather washed natural iodine deposits out of the exposed soil. Because the ice moved faster at lower altitudes, Less of the mineral survives in those regions and endemic goiters are more common. This explains why the number of goiters in a given area is not a direct result of altitude, a fact that was recognized by Dr. Galli Valerio in the 1920s. This means that goiters were likely more common in the low hills of the pre-alps where the Sacrimonti are located than along the steeper slopes higher up in the mountains. Whether writers blamed the springs or the soil, medical experts on both sides of the Alps have long understood the causes and severity of goiters to have a direct connection with the mountains themselves. Goiters were part of the cultural consciousness in early modern Italy. Even outside of the regions in which they were especially common, the condition was associated with Lombardy in particular. One of Michelangelo's best known sonnets described how he felt while painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling and includes a caricature life self-portrait of the artist at work. He addressed the poem to Giovanni da Pistoia in 1509, writing, quote, I have already grown a goiter from this torture, hunched up here like a cat in Lombardy or wherever else the stagnant waters poison. Artists that lived and worked in Northern Italy were also more likely to depict figures with goiters than those from other regions. Michelangelo Merisi da Caravaggio painted an old woman with a pronounced goiter in his Crucifixion of St. Andrew from 1607. In their analysis of the painting, Lurie and Mann interpreted the goiterous woman as an example of Caravaggio's hallmark naturalism, which is also often associated with Lombardy, um, a figure to inspire sympathy and a kind of attribute for the saint who was known to protect against sore throats and other neck ailments. Leonardo da Vinci, who had lived in Milan for most of the 1580s and 90s, is wildly credited with discovering the goiter, the thyroid gland, and is believed to have been the first to document its structure in his anatomical drawings. He and his followers also depicted goiters in a number of fanciful caricatures and grotesque portraits like these. Although the occurrence of endemic goiters has decreased dramatically over the course of the last century, Goiters are still recognized as a marker of local identity in art forms that continue to be practiced in Northern Italy. The figure of Giopino, for example, is a stock character in traditional puppet shows performed in and around Bergamo. Sarah Bergister describes him as uneducated and simple, but also hardworking and good-natured. Giopino came to represent Bergamo by responding to local stereotypes, and his character is identified by its large trinodal goiter. Images of goiters seem to be one realm in which art does not imitate life. Although women and children were more likely, are more likely to develop goiters, paintings and sculptures of what the doctors Dionigi describe as real goiters usually depict male subjects. In recent decades, there has been a spate of articles published by medical professionals, primarily in Italy, diagnosing goiters in figures painted by artists ranging from Artemisia Gentileschi to Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Many of these scholars suggest that small or diffuse goiters were seen as a mark of beauty, fertility, or even holiness during the early modern period um, and into the 19th century, obviously, with Rossetti, um, which conversely implies that large goiters indicate a particularly immoral or sinful host. While endocrinologists may well be more qualified than art historians to identify the early signs of a developing goiter, at times their assessments seem to ignore the issue of style almost completely. 
traditional interpretations of Gotsuti based in Renaissance humanism and aesthetics would support the idea of a causal relationship between goodness and beauty, however. Plato, for example, argued that beauty was synonymous with goodness, and Aristotle wrote that beauty is, quote, the gift of God, and therefore ugliness is a sign of um, spiritual punishment. Early modern writers not only built their philosophies on the foundation laid by classical thinkers, but they began to translate and circulate the ancient texts more widely, making them accessible to a broader audience. By the early 16th century, even learned laymen, such as Baldassare Castiglione, were publishing philosophical commentaries on the nature of good and evil. In his book of the Courtier, 1528, Castiglione wrote, quote, beauty is a sacred thing. It springs from God and is like a circle, the center of which is goodness. And just as one cannot have a circle without a center, one cannot have beauty without goodness. And in consequence, only rarely does an evil soul dwell within a beautiful body. And so outward beauty is a true sign of inward goodness. Um, the goiters at the Sacrimonti are undoubtedly real, according to the usage established by the Dionigi above. They are certainly too large to be mistaken for any other kind of neck swelling. And although most of the goiterous figures at the Sacrimonti are grouped with those who mock or torture Christ, other kinds of depictions on the mountains and elsewhere frustrate a simplistic equation of goiters and sin. I propose that interpreting these sculptures as a function of local geography, much like the goiters themselves, can provide a new lens through which to interpret the figures. The earliest uh, depiction of a goiter in the chapels of a Sacromonte, and that is a distinction that needs to be made, um, is found in Gaudenzio Ferrari's climactic crucifixion chapel at Barallo. His conspicuous uh, position at the center of the composition and direct interaction with Christ signal that he is not a marginal character within the group. The artist that led the post-Tridentine expansion and reorganization of Varallo often inserted distinctive characters from Gaudenzio's early chapels in their own sculptural groups in order to create a sense of continuity throughout the narrative sequence. Elena de Filippis has shown that artist contracts sometimes or often contained explicit instructions that the sculpture should, quote, conform as much as possible and resemble the other statues already on the Sacramonte, end quote. She traces the reappearance of other characters from Gaudenzio's crucifixion in later groups by Jean de Vespin and Giovanni d'Enrico as evidence of these intentional efforts to create narrative unity throughout the site. Both artists also incorporated figures with goiters in the chapels they designed. This is maybe the best known. Um, much like Gaudenzio Ferrari, Jean de Vespin highlighted the man with the goiter at the center of his composition in chapel 36. Giovanni D'Enrico's versions of this character sometimes seem to be tucked away or hidden behind other characters in the slide uh, in the crowd, such as the examples uh, in chapels 28, 29, and 37. These gozuti do not become obvious until the viewer begins to look for them. All of the goiterous figures at Barallo appear in scenes associated with the passion and actively work to advance the narrative by physically leading Christ towards his crucifixion. The chapels at Varese, Ozuccio, Domodossola, Brisago, and Sasfe also feature sculptures of men with goiters as part of the passion narrative. In general, these characters appear to become increasingly enthusiastic participants in Christ's ordeal over the course of the 17th century. But two sculptures at Crea and Orta are conspicuous for their depictions of goiters in scenes of Christian death outside of this usual context. Chapel One at Crea shows a man with a goiter distributing rocks to members of an angry mob during a failed attempt to stone St. Eusebius in the fourth century. The project was funded by the city of Vercelli, and so the image of that city's Basilica di Sant'Andrea in the background serves both to recognize their patronage and to indicate this, where the scene took place. During the Counter-Reformation and after the Council of Trent, Catholic leaders such as Gabriele Pagliotti argued that religious art should serve as books for the illiterate, obviously drawing on um, Gregory the Great, in direct opposition to Protestant groups that rejected all devotional images as idolatrous. The decrees of the council and the explanatory literature published by church leaders in its wake emphasized that art should convey religious narratives clearly, truthfully, and with historical accuracy. 
At Trent, the Catholic Church also reaffirmed the validity of relying on saints as inter intermediaries and examples of Christ-like behavior. Much like the distinctive image of Vercelli's Basilica in this chapel, the figure of the man with the goiter helps fix the event in a specific time and place, um, using visual clues, cues that would have been clear to local visitors. Goiters would have been common in this area around Vercelli, and although the basilica had never existed when Eusebius was bishop, it was well known and easily recognizable to pilgrims in the early modern era. Furthermore, Visitors who are already familiar with the other Gozzuti at Varallo might understand the presence of this similar figure at Crea as a symbol or reference to the saint's Christ-like righteousness in the face of his own martyrdom. Even outside the context of the Passion narrative, therefore, sculptures of men with goiters at the Sacrimonti can be understood to establish a local context for the scene and forge connections between the sites. The goiter's man in Chapel 16 at Orta stands out as a particularly positive image and compared to the examples at the other Sacrimonti. Dionigi Bussola modeled the scene of St. Francis's final return to Assisi in the late Seicento, probably between 1661 and 65. Once again, the man with the goiter appears at center stage, directly engaging with Francis, who is the main subject both of the chapel and the Sacramonte as a whole. His posture shows the man to be humble and reverent. He has removed his hat and lowered his gaze as he reaches out gingerly to touch the saint's robe. Like the woman described in the gospels who was healed of her chronic bleeding by touching the edge of Christ's cloak. The man's face is smooth and he doesn't grimace, leer or gesture aggressively like the goiter's men at the other Sacramenti, including three other examples that Bussola, um, and his workshop made for the chapels at Varese and Domodossola. Both of those figures in white at Domodossola have the, have the large goiter. Um, images of the man with the goiter that show him engaging in ugly or immoral behavior may be the norm of the Sacrimonti, but it was not uncommon to see devout Gozzutti in earlier examples of religious art in Lombardy. Two of the family workshops that Raffaele Casciaro names among the great masters of wood sculpture in Milan during the reign of the Sforza Dukes repeatedly included goiterous shepherds in scenes depicting the birth of Jesus and his mother around the turn of the 15th century. Or the 16th century, pardon me. The hilly terrain in the Alpine foothills was not particularly well suited for farming, but it offered an ideal environment for raising livestock. Shepherds were common in this region, especially among the hills and valleys most prone to goiters. Artists in Northern Italy would have been familiar with the sight of goiterous shepherds and so incorporated the malady in nativity scenes as a kind of professional attribute. Like the goiterous man at Orta, these shepherds usually appear as devout and somber witnesses. They look towards the Holy Family and lean forward attentively. An adoration of the shepherds by Giovanni Angelo del Mino at the Church of San Martino in Trevillo includes two shepherds. One is marked as such by the lamb in his arms, and the other bears a large no nodular goiter and seems to lean on a long lost crook. The artist's father, Giacomo del Mino, also used a goiter to identify a group of shepherds in a panel for his Ancona della Macolata at the Church of San Maurizio in Ponte. This scene relies on the viewer's familiarity with extra biblical accounts of Mary's birth, such as the golden legend, in order to recognize this scene and understand its place within the narrative as a whole. Jacobus de Borain records that Mary's father Joachim had been living with a group of shepherds outside of Jerusalem when he was visited by the angel that foretold the virgin's birth. Any remaining visual clues about the identity of these men would be difficult, um, if not impossible, to see at a distance. In the context of the narrative, however, their role becomes clear, suggesting that their garb and goiters alone might have been enough to reveal their occupation for contemporary viewers. Lombard artists, including Gaudenzio Ferrari, continue to include people with goiters in painted nat nativity scenes throughout the 16th century. In these images, goiters function as a marker of occupation, origin, and social class rather than moral standing. You can see him next to the Holy Family. 
Recontextualizing the Sacrimonti's goiterous figures can help us understand them as dynamic characters with a variety of possible roles and responses, just like all of the other figures in the scenes. Rather than, oh, rather than reading these images as one-dimensional moralistic warnings about the effects of sinful behavior, framing the goiter as a mark of regional identity establishes a local context for these spiritual narratives in much the same way that Luigi Mario Belloni described the effect of the contemporary looking clothing in the chapels at Ozuccio. Quote, these are not the figures of Jews or Roman legionnaires, but living and vibrant portraits of the people who lived in the hamlets of Ozuccio at that time, end quote. Just as the man with the goiter indicates the place and participation of Lombard citizens in the scene of St. Eusebius's martyrdom at Crea, Perhaps we can interpret his presence in the Passion Chapels at other Sacrimonti as a kind of representation or reminder of the local pilgrim who worshipped there, an early modern spiritual avatar of sorts. Similar to the idea of an Easter egg in modern films, the man with the goiter is more noticeable and more meaningful to those who have already encountered him at other sites. Repeated images of this character create iconographic unity across the Sacrimonti, similar to the way that the repetition of distinctive figures from Ferrari's early groups at Ferralo created a sense of narrative continuity in the chapels that came to be built there later. His presence is a touchstone that exemplifies the Sacrimonti's role as a unified system of spiritual and cultural propaganda. The well-known causal links between goiters and the land in which they were most common further emphasizes how the sites work to anchor counter-reformation spiritual practices within the communities and landscapes they occupy. Thanks very much. We move now to a uh, discussion by Professor Claire Fargo, um, uh, Emerita at the University of Colorado in, in Boulder. She works particularly on cultural exchange between Europe and the rest of the world and the processes of globalization and the critical historiography of the discipline. She's recently co been co-author of a big, uh, of a, uh, an edition of uh, Leonardo's Trattato della Pittura uh, and she is um, also, well, I, I also found her volume on um, um, the uh, reframing the Renaissance particularly valuable. So uh, I will leave you leave uh, Claire to uh, lead to, to give her comments. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that nice introduction um, and for inviting me to participate in this conference. I'm really delighted to be here. And a shout out to George, my old compatriot from graduate school many years ago. Funny that we should end up here. I remember George saying it's hard to concentrate with all the palm trees, but evidently he managed to do so. That was a really beautiful paper, George. I'm so embarrassed. I have just very simple comments, uh, oral comments. Um, so much uh, has transpired in our uh, two days together here. I've learned so much. Uh, these last two papers were both extremely creative and unusual contributions to the existing uh, literature. And I thought maybe what I could do was to um, talk about some of the general themes that seem to be emerging um, uh, with respect to these two papers, but also the conference uh, as a whole, if that's okay, um, uh, for just a few minutes. And I wanted to start with Jeffrey uh, Simcox's uh, framing of the conference. And Jeffrey, congratulations on this book, which is such an amazing product of so many years of work. It's like an archive from the archive. So the historiography that you wrote also made a, an original contribution to art history that I wanted to single out. Um, since my interests um, have always been very historiographical. When you start off by saying that uh, with Samuel Butler, we have the first systematic uh, study of the Sacramonte and what an important point that is in the late 19th century when the uh, positivist uh, uh, method of uh, basing study on documents uh, started with the Sacramonte. And you uh, compare those uh, that approach with the approach of Charles Eastlake and others that were forming the National Gallery, collect, 
collection. I think there's a lot more there because at that point in 1877, uh, Eastlake and his, uh, and his uh, collective um, uh, group uh, were very much um, in the enthralled by Giovanni Morelli, who was against the documentation that Wilhelm von Bode in Berlin and others were um, uh, very much pushing. And so their idea was to look at the works of art directly um, and to be able to make judgments of attribution based on location. So location was very important to them also, but they were kind of the renegades to be looking at the visual evidence and not relying solely on the documents. And this is really, um, uh, uh, now we don't do one or the other, we always do both, of course, and it's very interdisciplinary. But this needs to be unpacked a lot more, I think, because um, for Eastlake and for Morelli, the uh, theories of Darwin were very, very important. And they thought that they could link artists to their place without having to contextualize it in cultural information and sociological information. And so you can see that these are really opposite approaches to art history. And we're still struggling to figure all that out. But I think that initial moment, um, which was grounded in really a racial theory um, of associating people's external um, uh, way of making art with their mentality. Um, and what's so complicated is that, for example, as we've seen in this conference, the internal uh, mentality of the figures that are represented in the Sacramonte are in some relationship to their external appearance, as we saw so well with the, the goiters, for example. And then everything gets really muddy, is how do we get from the 16th century to the 20th century with this idea of the internal, external, that is part of our uh, conceptual baggage. So I just leave that um, there, uh, but there is a lot more, and, and you've made really a, a an original contribution to the historiography of art history because I've never heard anybody speak of Samuel Butler and his documentation of popular religious devotion. What was really, to me, going on at this time is the separation of high art from low art using anachronistic categories to look at low art and what we've been seeing with the Sacramonte and at least since 1980, as you're pointing out, is the bringing the uh, period designations of what counts as art and how it counts to bear on our historical understanding of this period. So there is no way to separate the popular religious devotional efforts from the high art in terms of how viewers respond to it. And that last quote, uh, Carla, that you gave about women and children and other intelligent, intellectual people, that's another way of saying, well, that's the universal audience. So women and children need material guidance, according to a long historical literary tradition. And the conoscenti, they should be able to get everything by themselves. The Sacramonti from the beginning appealed to all, all audiences, universal audiences. So that's, that's one thought. Um, I'm very interested in the theological underpinnings and how they changed and from my outsiders. I'm not a specialist in this at all, but from the outsider's perspective, when um, Bernardo Kemi founded the Sacramonte at Varallo and, um, and, and Giovanni Moroni and other people wrote about it as being an amazing artless experience, everybody who went there was an individual participant. So they could respond just as Alberti talked about painting with their own experience and participate in these religious mysteries. But with the coming of the Council of Trent and the attempt to redirect artistic license, it was a very big problem to have your own individual response to a shared story. So a lot of what I see going on uh, in this time period of the Catholic Reformation, which seems to be the main focus of research for at least for art historians and an interdisciplinary group of scholars, is how to control the vision. How do you control the embodied experience? Make it embodied, but make it virtual and make everybody have the same experience to control the dogma. Um, and I'm also, we've been talking now at this conference, but even before, a lot about grates. I didn't know about the glass partitions. That's a huge amount of glass we're talking about. It's interesting technologically that that would even be possible. 
but what I haven't really seen so, so much talk about is that vision and coming to knowledge through vision is supposed to be difficult. So obscuring the vision or, or creating the mountain that makes the visual experience obfuscated, I mean, isn't that what Augustine is saying all along in a very widely diffused Christian tradition that's shared by all, that to be able to see the goodness in the created world, you have to really try. You have to expend effort. And so then that brings me to another point that I think has been so important in these last two papers um, and was originally part of what Jeffrey asked me to do, was to talk about health issues. So in what way are we looking at the Sacramonti as part of a big health system? In a day, in days before health insurance or days after the end of health insurance, um, what do we think about the kind of restorative properties of nature? And, um, and the goiters are a great example because they were thought to have been caused by the healing water has gone awry. So the doubleness of all of that seems very interesting to me too. So what if we considered uh, uh, Christian optimism in terms of its, um, if, of its healing properties um, for which there's a long tradition and then they're constantly trying to make up for, uh, for lack of other ways of, of gaining health. Because, of course, the plague of 1576 and 77 falls right in the middle of this, and uh, Borromeo was sure that it was caused by sin. So rethinking the whole experience of imitating Christ, not in terms of how many steps of penance do you take walking around the holy Jerusalem, but in terms of being indoctrinated into the system where you start with original sin with Adam and Eve, and you end with the transfiguration um, uh, uh, through the, the exorcism of bodily uh, weakness and bodily sin is a, a very different narrative. First of all, it is a linear narrative. And secondly, it's teaching you the whole Christian dogma, not your personal experience of visiting the Holy Land. So I think that's a lot to talk about. Um, it could be a lot to talk about there, I think, to think about this um, intradisciplinarily as, as a healthcare system. Um, certainly my experience with um, the Franciscans in the Southwest, because I was in Colorado until recently when I retired, <clears throat> I don't know the topography of, um, of uh, Western Los Angeles as, uh, as uh, George does uh, in the same way. But I know a little bit about the, the Franciscans in New Mexico where there weren't priests. So the confraternities that ran the uh, Passion Week enactments of the Passion were providing information and also experience of the healing of the Christian faith without priests. So initially at the Sacramonte of Kemi, we think from the guidebooks that priests either walk along with you or encourage you to have certain thoughts in your head before you went out there on your own. So what do you do when you want to control the whole dogma and at the same time you're providing a kind of health service, uh, especially for the poor. So like the goiters um, that mark things as coming from this specific region of Lombardy, mark the people as coming from that specific place and appealing to the local pilgrims. Did they expect to be cured? So there are lots of open questions. And I think, Carla, in your paper, maybe the part that you didn't talk about so much. Um, there's no evidence of any Paschal procession at Varallo. Um, Borromeo condemned Sacra Representazione in 1565, right? So uh, there are close connections between the confraternities and the Sacramonte and how they function. So what can we make about that whole complex of things together? What does that say about ways of rethinking the uh, participation while still 
controlling vision and controlling dogma. How do you receive it? Well, this is a huge problem and in the American Southwest with a strong Native American presence and no priests and people intermarrying even though there were social restrictions of who was Native American, who wasn't. Um, there was a lot of information that was coming into the visual imagery that uh, uh, was associated with the local culture, that is with indigenous Native American culture too, that was um, an anathema to the priest, to the secular priest maybe, if there were some, uh, definitely to the Franciscan friars, but everybody had to sort of live together. The visual imagery allowed people to carry their own cultural backgrounds to the images um, and, and coexist, maybe not sharing the same beliefs, but it depends on what you bring to that viewing experience. So how was that still preserved in these new conditions? I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering. The topomimesis, it became less important that you perform penance and how many steps you take, but it became more important to control that narrative. So anyway, that's what I'm sort of seeing from this fuzziness the fuzzy relationship between what is an actual sacred altarpiece and what is a faux representation for a didactic purpose where there were people actually expecting to be cured of their um, ailments, afflictions, mental and physical. And that's the other thing about goiters. I had to look up Cretanism, um, uh, Kenneth, to find out why Cretanism was connected with goiters. And it turns out that that thyroid condition causes developmental delays, so it makes people stupid. I mean, it makes the people who are uneducated also, they become mentally infirm. So all kinds of class projections of goiters and class status and mental ability and how people are gonna learn this Christian dogma. In, in, in New Mexico, the dogma had to be, or in all of the, the um, um, vice royalties uh, uh, in New Spain. People had to be taught across enormous language and world cultural view barriers. So everything got really simplified in ways that you can connect with the story and believe that it's going to help you. Um, how, does that, how does that work in this Catholic Reformation environment? Um, anyway, I think I'll stop there. I have so many more other you know, wonderful responses to these great papers. So I leave it there. I don't know. Does that make any sense to you? That's my thoughts. Claire, uh, thank you very much. Yes, there is much here to think about and unpack. Um, uh, now, it was supposed the final proceedings were supposed to be a discussion between Nick and me, but I think I've already said more than enough already. And so I will hand everything over to Nick and then perhaps make a, a concluding valedictory remark at the end. So Nick, can I hand over to you? So I was, I was saying, I was just thanking Jeffrey for uh, uh, bringing us together and CMRS for sponsoring it. Um, and just saying, you know, we haven't had the chance to bask physically in the Californian Holy Land. Uh, but we've been able to share that warmth and intensity virtually. And in light of our subject, that's probably the better way to anyway, the more appropriate form. Um, so uh, Jeffrey had asked me to maybe identify a few themes that were running through the different papers. And uh, I've been trying to do that just as a way to maybe draw some things together. So nothing really new and certainly nothing as, as deep as, uh, as, as the others have brought out. But I thought, you know, there's a couple of things we can point out in terms of uh, uh, theology and then in locality, and then thirdly, materiality and physicality. And uh, for theology, I thought uh, Marianne Ritzma van Eck and Grace Harpster and Rebecca Gill all emphasized taking theology seriously, uh, while also showing that this doesn't necessarily mean theological texts as such. And I think this is one of the, the key elements that what we've got here is this, this thing called observantism. It's a key factor. But it's it's still also something that's a bit hard to get a get a get a, get an actual fix on, which is again probably the good thing. It's easier to identify observant values, uh, orientations, than it is say formal theological positions. And we certainly see observant values around purity, around materiality, around asceticism, around imitative piety. And I think these are the kind of things that come in and uh, reinforce a lot of what, what happens uh, later on. Um, 
Then the other thing, theologically, what about the role to broader movements of reform? Uh, we've seen uh, a number of, say, you could say, outside Catholic reformers like Borromeo, Bascape, Giacobini, all playing mixed roles as motivators and mediators. Uh, but as uh, uh, Eduardo Tortorolo showed, their efforts sometimes clash with lay authorities and with those contentious Franciscans, which then brings up relations, you know, what are the relations, say, between uh, this and popular uh, or local religion? And one thing I was thinking about is what should we read into the fact that the sites of these multi are often deliberately chosen by their founders while when you look to late medieval or Renaissance shrines, they often gain their magnetic pull, in a sense their, their creation narrative is that they were chosen not by people, but chosen by God or by Mary or Christ or a saint who, who identifies the site by means of a miracle. With, with the Sacri Monti, there's something much more deliberate that's closer, I think, to early modern Catholic reform than to medieval popular piety. There's something that, uh, Again, Roberto was saying there's something more uh, deliberately didactic about it. Um, moving into locality, I think we, we've seen a number of cases where the Sacri Monti are at that intersection of church local and church universal. Uh, Kenneth Forte's paper on goiters underscores this in the most immediately uh, geographical, environmental, biological way. Uh, and Matthew Vesters uh, moved that into questions about Alpine sociology. And, as I was trying to suggest yesterday, that may then also intersect with some of the questions about gender, gender roles and relations in Alpine communities. And that might be one reason why those uh, Franciscan observants, whose practices are quite often distinctly misogynistic, why they're so often at odds with local communities and local authorities. Uh, and if we distinguish local and universal in that way, it's not necessarily to oppose them, but to kind of expose or and, and, and tease out their intersections, which uh, come out, I think, even more clearly in that third thing that we've looked at and that we've been talking about more today, that uh, about materiality and physicality. And, and, and most of the papers, and particularly the four today, have emphasized uh, materiality and bodily experience as critical to understanding how and why these Sacri Multi emerged and developed artistically as sites of local religion. Uh, and Carla Benson reminds us uh, this wonderful quote, uh, quote, the conjunction of visual and bodily engagement at these sites produces a complex mode of imaginative engagement, a form of via mixta that connects rather than separates medieval and early modern pilgrimage practices. And I think today's papers in particular illuminate that intersection of the material, the spiritual and the emotive and they then underscore the resulting tensions around identification. The Sacri Monti are really embodiments of the uh, imitatio Christi, which is a key observant value. And uh, Rebecca Gill uh, quotes Medina Lasansky on this. Uh, it's the movement through space that helps the pilgrim to interpret and make sense of what they see. The body is a device of perception. And I think we can, you know, after our discussion today, we can take that a step further. Uh, the body is a device of perception, but it's also, as a few people have mentioned, it's a device of participation. Uh, Carla's mentioned this, uh, Rebecca's mentioned this, it's, and Rebecca in particular, when she mentions that it's local communal authorities who commissioned Alessi's plans that would put the terracotta sculptures behind glass. Does that mean, uh, uh, at, uh, what I've assumed, but does it mean that before this time you could walk around them and among them, which I think is, is what the graffiti really suggests, right? Um, the, the statues and the frescoes heighten this bodily imitatio. Uh, yet as Grace uh, Harpster went on, went on to show, it seems that some like Borromeo find this electric pull of identification to be not only compelling, but also in some way threatening. And when Borromeo orders that distance, that separation, the grid, the decorum of screens, grills and glass, what is he protecting? Is he protecting the statues or is he protecting the pilgrims? Is this bodily imitatio too intense? And think back to some of the Renaissance uh, shrines where often the images were kept under, under wraps for most of the year and only revealed once, uh, once a year. So, so you're protecting the charisma of the image as well, which protects its, its uh, spiritual power. I think that when the 
when we see the later chapels becoming ever more dramatic, I think the question that rises for me, is that some compensation for the less immediate imitatio? There's an aestheticizing that's going on. The devotees are distanced. And I think as a few people pointed out today, they, they become spectators less than participants. So uh, there, there's a huge number of other issues to raise up here. Uh, food history. I, I wanted to ask Grace actually more about the, the food and, the, and, and particularly the pears. That, that uh, uh, figure number 27, the, uh, the Last Supper, everybody would have known that those pears were out of season and pears were an elite fruit. And so I was curious about that kind of small detail which raises all sorts of other little questions. And so I was curious too, after what re read in your text, uh, that the pears were still there. But there's spatial history, emotional history, environmental history, bodily history, global history. We haven't really even explored yet the question of race. But it's obvious in some of these images, particularly in the portrayal of the enemies of Christ, but then also, as we've seen today, in all those blonde disciples. Um, so there's clearly far more to discuss. And so we all await that second edition of Jeffrey's book that he promised us yesterday. We, we also await the time when we can meet together, perhaps in Viralo or in San Vivaldo or in Laverna, or perhaps and more likely in that Franciscan holy land that some people call California. And perhaps the, the pull of this subject for us is that we're really at the end, we're all academic pilgrims of a sort and we're drawn to sites where we can collaborate intensely. For now, it's been virtual, but it's also been extraordinarily stimulating, very engaging. Thanks to all of you, to all the participants in the discussions, and thanks again to Jeffrey Simcox and to the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies for bringing us together. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Unmute. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, I have a few things to say. I don't want to um, elaborate too much on the papers, but um, I was really impressed with the high quality of all the papers and then with the high quality of the discussion. Um, I think uh, my experience of conferences is that there is a certain, from time to time, a certain longueur uh, in that uh, results from people droning on. Uh, perhaps we were limited and couldn't drone on too much, which may be a good thing, but the discussion was all very good, very stimulating, very high level, and uh, I have learned a great deal. And Nick, um, getting the second edition of the damn book out is going to take a long time because I'm going to have to incorporate all the things that were said at this conference, as well as all the literature I obviously failed to read and which has been brought to my attention. Now, um, so really, I have to say uh, also that this virtual format uh, is restrictive in certain ways. I mean, we can't get together. The, the idea of um, commensality and drinks and dinner together and chit chat, that is ruled out. But on the other hand, um, I was startled to see that we have 68 participants listed as uh, in this conference, and I see that several of them are from Italy, including two people that I see are from the Centro di Documentazione, and I welcome them, and thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you this has been profitable. Next time I'm in Italy, I will certainly come and visit you whenever <laughs> whenever that happens to be. So the Bennett, there is this paradoxical benefit of the virtual format which it allows which allows people who would not have been able to travel physically to the conference um, to participate so it's sort of like brother Kaimi's idea of Jerusalem the virtual Jerusalem so you don't have to go actually to Jerusalem you can uh, go to Varallo and participate so this is a sort of postmodern virtual Varallo that we have here. Um, now, uh, finally, um, what I must do is express deep 
thanks to, uh, first of all, the staff at the MedRen Center, to Erin and Karen Burgess for helping me get this together. I, Lord knows, am electronically illiterate. Uh, without them, I would not have been able to do anything like this. And thanks to them, it, I think it has been a great success. Uh, and I am very grateful to everybody. I thank you all very much for making this a really splendid experience. So thank you and ciao.